Authentication is uh, you as like letting me know I'm saying I'm Richard and is am 
am I, claim. Richard? I claim to be Richard. That's authentication. Uh, authentication authorization is like the level of privilege that I have, right? Am I authorized to view this product? Right. So authorization would be basically everything we looked at and studied in access control, right? What can a person do? Authentication is how you actually um, how do you verify that this essentially this person is who they say they are or uh, this person says they are who they are on this website or on this system. Um, so I think of it as like authentication is who are you, right? Trying to prove who you are. And then authorization is what can you do, right? So it's one of these tricky things. It's because we talk about this slightly backwards because in order to know what you can do, I first need to know who you are, right? But to get the authorization, to get authentication, we need to do crypto stuff, and I think uh, <coughs> so. That's why I organized it that way. Anyways, so the idea is, uh, and this is kind of circling back. We reuse a lot of these terms in the authorization and access control. So the idea is, we have there's a principal, so there is some unique entity, and the identity specifies that principal and is an internal internal representation of an entity. So you would be the principal, the identity would be, let's say, your um, account on the submission server, right? That name is tied to your specific um, identity, or your entity. Uh, and then a subject acts on behalf of identity. We talked about this with process. A process usually runs with the permissions of the user. And finally, so using this, authentication really is a little bit more formally binding some identity to some subject. So we can say that, yes, this person is associated with this login information. So how do we do this? How do we do this in the real world? How do you know, and this gets back to kind of identity, is how do you actually know who people are, who they say they are?
how would you know that it's me? Yeah, as a, I mean, common what bartender tactic is to then ask the date of birth or issue date or so it'll require you to Quiz regurgitate some information from from the ID. From the card that they just gave you. No, because uh, that's why I think issue date's the one, but I was like, I, I, I don't know, I never know my issue date, so I never asked that to people because I was like, who knows their issue? Yeah, I wouldn't know either. So how else, is there any other, I mean, think about like a, I don't know, crazy like soap opera or something, right, where somebody like comes back after 10 years, they don't have an ID or anything, and they claim to be somebody. How would you be able to verify that it's actually them? Either stored somewhere or 
it had to have been in some easily recoverable place that they could actually extract some usable DNA. I'm not an expert, so I don't know all these places where they could or could not extract that from. Um, and then all these security questions is kind of what we think of them now, but even, you know, that's kind of just quizzing you on yourself. So, uh, yeah, you got fun. Why? I mean, what, are we trying to authorize you to work for the DOD, or are we trying to get you a driver's license, or? Anything. I mean, because there's, depending on the context, depends on how sure or more <coughs> sure you want to, I mean, there's no way to be absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. I could take a, my friend's driver's license that I look kind of like and go to the DMV and get a new driver's license issued in his name mm -hmm. and send to my address. Yep. There's no guarantee there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two comments. I had an acquaintance in college that would buy booze with her sister's driver's license all the time. She was about 21. And we don't even have to go to the extreme of the uh, soap opera. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that there are lots of transient or people currently experiencing homelessness, maybe have varying degrees of paranoid schizophrenia yeah. that live out of a duffel bag and don't have identification. Yeah. And you know, when you think about that problem, well, they need food, they need money, they need a job. How do you get a job? You have to file an I-9, so you can pay taxes, and you have to have identification to do that. Uh -huh. So there are constantly people even in this city, in this town, you can probably see them on the street, that are in this state of, I have no identification, right. I think I know my name, and I need to collect my social security that I qualify for because I have a mental disability, and they can't because they have no identification. So it's a very real problem. Definitely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a great point. Um, yeah. Not all Americans are issued social security numbers. So not everyone has a social security number? I think it's the Amish. So yeah, there's all, this is definitely fraught with all kinds of issues. Um, so let's go back to, I wanna go back to the asking you something that you, let's say, knew in childhood or something, right? So, so if you ask me, I don't know, what's my favorite, uh, like I would go back to the example, college football team. So I guess the other thing is when you're verifying somebody, you're trying to verify, are they actually who they say they are or are they an imposter pretending to be somebody else, right? So if you were to ask somebody who claimed to be me, hey, what's your favorite college, collegiate football team? <coughs> well, if they're an imposter, what would they probably say? Yeah. Well, I, I would first guess UC Santa Barbara. They don't have a football team, so. Okay. Yes. Then I would guess whoever won the district championship the year that you graduated, or oh, sure. around there. And then probably Google what the most popular team was. That would be my third guess. You're forgetting like sometimes. Okay, ASU. So you don't have much fun. Yeah, ASU, right? Because I don't have any other teams. You just, you just work really here, actually though. none. Yeah, I work here, but you know. You could hear you say none. You could say none, so you could say I don't. Yeah, you could, uh, or you could. Try to learn more about me. You could stalk me on different social networks and try to figure that out beforehand before trying to be me. You could try to hack into my Gmail or my Dropbox to learn more information about me in order to get those, those questions and those answers. These are all really good. So now let's take it to kind of the computer realm. So when you're actually so we'll, not to pick on any site in particular, so we'll use the uh, submission site because I made it last time. Um, so how does that submission site verify you? How does it actually tie that account back to you, the person? Yeah. It asked us for an ASU ID number? It asked you for an ASU ID number before you registered, right? So those are, this isn't a foolproof system. Those are not public knowledge, and they are considered sensitive information, so it's uh, acceptable-ish to use that. And nobody's complaining that somebody else signed up as them, so it's also fine, so they also have to be unique. You would be able to tell if somebody else signed up with yours. Um, so ask for the ASU ID, so that ties what to what?
username to the individual? The username to? The ASU's record of the individual. ASU's record of the individual, yeah, that's definitely what I'd say, because you can't really, even tying that back, like who actually verified that, you know, you're, you could be assuming somebody's identity or whatever, I mean, that's all kind of craziness, <laughs> right? So that ties there and with there. So you register, you, you log in, you create, I mean, you register, you get an account, you have a username, and now you go to log in again because you need to submit homework too. So now how does the website know that it's you? Does it remember you and go, hey, good to see ya. I remember you from two months ago when you first signed in. <laughs> I have Chrome take care of that for me. Cool, but what does it do? I mean, what, what is the server doing? Right, so hey, most of the time I can't actually, honestly do not remember how long the set minutes last, but uh, it should log you out at intervals, is that correct? No. Okay, it's assumed you've logged out for security purposes and you go to the website or you're on a different computer. Let's say this, you're on a different computer. How do you prove to the site that you are that user account? Input your username and password. Input your username and password, which does what? Where did that password come from? When? When you created the account. So that password is a piece of information that links that account number to you the person who created the account, right? So you have these two pieces of information. The password links you, uh, links the person who created the account to the account, and then the ASU ID links that account with your ASU information, right? So, and actually, this is kind of similar in some way to uh, what we talked about with using maybe something from the past, right? So this, what, a password should be something that only you know, right? You created that account, you're sharing some piece of information with the server, and so the server basically says, hey, whenever you come back here, tell me this thing again, and I will know that it's actually you, and not somebody pretending to be you. So this is one of the main authentication mechanisms that we deal with now, which is essentially, so there's like four categories we'll talk about very broadly, what you know. <laughs> So what do you know? So I can try to authenticate you based on what you know. So if I wanted to authenticate you as a student in the class, I would probably start, like we said, asking questions, right? Interrogating you about what were the homeworks, what kind of things, you know, what things that we talked about, um, and try to see if you're actually in the class or you're just somebody pretending to say, yes, I am in this class, but you've never actually been to a class or watched any of the lectures. Is an ID card something you know? something that you have that shows that you are, so if you've ever, um, that's not a good example. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, the second main category is something that you possess, that you have, right? So this is the ID card, right? You can always lose your ID card. You can get issued new ID cards, but when you, have this ID card, you can give that to somebody and they can try to authenticate that yes, you are the name on this card and they'll do that through all the methods we talked about, right? Look at the picture, compare the picture with you, look at the other metadata on the card to try to compare that with the person they're talking to. They may quiz you questions about the card. Um, they may, uh, oh, they may even try to swipe the card to see what debt data is there or try to contact the card issuer to see if it's a valid card. Um, they can try, which may get around the look like sister attack, um, they may ask you for other cards that you have that have the same name, right? So show me a credit card even if it doesn't have a picture with that same name on it, right? Which can then try to verify that, yeah, you know, you, you're having, you're showing essentially multiple things that you possess to try to prove that you are that person. Yeah. But it depends on where the card is from, too. Yep. Because, like, a school ID, you can't use it for, like, going to the airport. Absolutely. Why not? Just because it's, they can't, they can't verify that it's a source that can be trusted. Exactly. So, yeah, and so that's definitely um, something when you think about when you're doing the verification, right? Just because somebody hands you a card doesn't mean you automatically 
assume they are who they say they are, right? That kind of goes back to the example of a cardboard ID card you make yourself, right? You can hand that to anybody, but whether they actually believe it or not is up to them, right? That's a good point. So are fingerprints either of these two? Or DNA? Is DNA something that you know? Are your fingerprints something that you know? You can look at them, yes, I agree. Do you possess them? I'd say they're a trait. What was that? I'd say they're a trait. They're a trait? Something that's part of, like, uh, you don't really possess them, but they're part of you. So right, like so, exactly. Yeah, so they're not necessarily something that you possess. They're not <laughs> a part that you can just lose. You can't go get a new set of fingerprints or new DNA, at least not yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the third category is, is essentially what you are, and things like um, fingerprint scanners, uh, facial recognition, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, DNA, and, or like retina scanning, right? These are all things that are what you are. Voice recognition, I think, would probably fall into that too. So again, just like the previous example, let's say they match. Does that mean that they definitely are that person? No. No? So let's think about voice, right? If you're authenticating somebody because you know their voice, and somebody comes up to you, maybe you can't see them or whatever, it's dark, and they start speaking in my voice, would you, do you know that that's definitely me? Why not? People can mimic other people's voices. You can mimic other people's voice. You can record the voice. You could probably string together coherent sentences from everything I've said in my lectures on YouTube. You could probably take that and use that to create like coherent sentences, which is now scary now that I think about it, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, so yeah, what you know, what you possess, what you are, these are the three main categories of things we think about that go into authentication. Um, there's a fourth one that's actually really interesting. Um, and that's, so I'm trying to think of a good example to give you that. Okay, so, let's say, is there a difference? thinking about like a CEO attack. So uh, there's this, basically this uh, type of fraud where uh, people will either call or email a, uh, usually like a CFO or somebody in the financial uh, part of an organization and they will say, it's the CEO, I just closed this deal, this you know, $2 million deal with this other company, I need you, you know, this is gonna be huge for us, we're gonna make us tons of money. I'm jumping on a plane right now, but I need you to wire $2 million to this account so that we can close this deal, you know, otherwise our company's gonna go under. And so they'll either call or they'll uh, send an email. And uh, so one of the things that would go in there, right, is now the person on the receiving end essentially has to try to authenticate this either phone call or something, right? So is it any difference, let's say it's exactly the same voice content <laughs> Um, if it's somebody in person talking with you versus on the phone, that's not a good, not a good, bad example. Let's use a different example. Um, yeah, okay, this is too difficult. Sorry. Where you are. So I was trying to get like in person versus somebody who's calling you on a phone call from far away. I think another example would be maybe the well, caller ID is also tricky. So. You would think of like a local, like maybe it's the CEO's number that's calling you versus it's a external foreign phone call coming in that would tell you that they're out of the country and caller ID can be trivial, trivially spooked, so this is not a good example, but uh, yeah. It'd be like giving your credit card number over the phone or like to somebody in person would be like a good example. Yes, yes, that is a good. I'm a little more hesitant to give somebody a credit card over the phone than in, in person. 
person. That's a good example. That's great. And then uh, also Visa and MasterCard and the credit card companies feel the same way because they will charge the merchants different overhead rates depending on whether they uh, have in-person credit card swiping and or sign the credit card versus doing over the phone or just over internet transactions because they know that the fraud rate could be higher. Cool, good example. I'm stealing that for later. Thanks. So these are kind of basically the way we think about different types of authentication me mechanisms. And I think, does anybody, can anybody come up with one that's not, doesn't fit into these, one of these categories? trying to get at what you are. So there's also, there's been some work in um, authenticating, doing continuous authentication on your phone. So you take your phone, type in your, either your PIN or use your fingerprint to log into your phone, and then while you're using the phone, it's actually keeping track of your gate, and it's trained before on the pass on your gate, and so that that way if somebody else steals your phone and uses it, even while it's unlocked, it can lock itself, because it doesn't think it's actually you. Um, various types of things. I say that still, it's trying to get at what you are, right? It's trying to develop some unique signal just from you that, uh, but it is tricky because yeah, you can always change your gate maybe, but consciously, but unconsciously you shouldn't be able to do that. Similarly with typing, so you can measure the speed in between key presses on the keyboard and that's roughly-ish unique. Yeah, anything else? So just like when we looked at crypto systems, we're, we're going to be thinking about authentication systems in kind of a more abstract manner. Um, and this will actually help us then think about well, how do you attack these, what's actually the attacker's goal, um, how does different mechanisms that we're going to talk about, salting, hashing, whatever, how does that actually change the authentication system and how can we think about this in a more rigorous way. Um, Actless. I wish this was a good acronym. That would be cool. Maybe we can move things around later. Uh, Capels. Anyways, uh, probably not good to just shout out random acronyms. I'm realizing. Uh, okay, so A is a set of some authentication information that proves the identity. So this, similarly to the, let's say, the plain text key space, right? This information may be restricted in some some way. Some systems will only, let's say, accept as a password lowercase characters. Or if you're setting up, let's say, a PIN code for your credit card or your debit card, right? That can only be alphanumeric. So A, you know, the set of authentication information is all four-digit alpha, uh, four-digit <coughs> PIN code, uh, numeric code. Some authentication systems are super broken, and no matter what long password you type in, will only use the first eight characters. So the space there, the A's you could possibly use is a lot lower too. C is the complementary information. So this is some information that's stored by the system that's used to validate the authentication information. For now, we can think of it as, you know, similar to our DNA example. So A would be your DNA, and C would be, I, anybody a biologist or in the, bio program and taking this class and knows how much how much data is stored in like a DNA sample from one person. 
I know it's a lot. I think it's a lot. It's not a small amount of information, even <coughs> even when it's compressed because you only have you know the whatever the four I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, the DNA. Uh, anyways, rather than storing all that information, what I may want to do is only store a subset of that and check that against new samples that that subset matches. And I'd want to make sure that the subsets are relatively unique among people and blah 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 blah. Um, but the idea is that C, like I could just store the entire DNA sequence and then match that with whoever comes to me uh, who claims that they're you and wants a DNA test. But so C and A can be the same, right? Or they can be different where C is a res some restricted set. So F, F is a set of functions that can turn A's into C's. So in this DNA case, it would be the function that selects which gene pairs, sequences, I think is the correct term, which sequences it actually stores. I should not use the examples where I don't actually know what I'm talking about, so I apologize to any biologists who are listening to this. And so L then are functions that verify the identity. So these are functions that take in A and C and return either true or false. So this is like the login function. Or in our DNA case, this would be the DNA testing lab that you give them some new A, they, do you give them C? No, C comes from the system, right? C is stored on the system. So you only externally give A. The system takes C, the complementary information that you've stored, and will tell you, yes, this is you, or no, it's not you. Uh, and then I think if you could make this a little bit more complicated, especially in the case of DNA, which you could have percentage matching, so you could um, change that. But for now, we'll think of it in binary terms, either you know, true or false. And S is really just for completeness. These are ways that you can change, either create a new A or create or alter your stored C. So this would be changing your password or something like that, right? Any questions here? Cool. So we'll go with a super simple password system. So this is just examples to see kind of how this framework works. So passwords stored in plain text. So what does that mean? Stored in plain text, right? Just normal. So the authentication system here would be what? What would be the A's? Describe the set A in this case. This individual or for all users of the system? All, it's a system wide thing. <clears throat> or, yeah, it's a system wide th thing in the sense that what does the system allow, not a specific instantiation of the system. So A is not, uh, if we go back, A here is not, so these are all sets. So A is the set of possible authentication information that proves an identity. So you as a user select some little a in a, and that is your authentication information, or you may not be able to select in the case of DNA, right? You have some a in this little a in this big a, um, and that generates with f. So f takes in that little a and produces some little c, which is an element in c, um, and that's your actual complementary information. And then l takes, can take a and c and return lower, lowercase a and c, and um, return either true or false. So let's, what would be the set A in this case? set of complementary information. Mm -hmm. 
those the specific passwords? That's the set of the set of little C's that have been chosen. No, that could be chosen. Could be chosen. Though. Yes. Yes. Same as A. Yeah. Mm. The same as A, right? So it's um, so it's any you know you're, you're storing the password. If the passwords are eight at most eight digit alphanumerics, then the sets obviously have to be the same. Cool. So. Yes. And maybe because I think I just asked this. Talking about in this sense, but couldn't we also talk about A in terms of like with this system that we're talking about? We haven't talked about a username, but I would think that A, well, I don't know, I would think that C as the information stored on the system would be a strict subset of A that would, if, if the particular value is entered, would actually let you. Why is C not the actual condensed box of or bag of passwords subset of A that's actually in use? So we're describing essentially all possible instantiations of a password system that uses plain text passwords that are eight characters long alphanumeric. So this is all possible instances. So basically, we're saying um, A is one through eight alphanumeric. C is exactly the same. So those are what passwords and our complementary information are drawn from. If, on the other hand, we said we're using SHA-256 as our function, and we'll see in a second, F, to turn passwords into complementary information, then C is not all alphanumeric characters. It's actually limited to 256-byte uh, numbers, or whatever that is in hexadecimal. I don't know, but it's a hexadecimal. So it just defines kind of the space there. So it's not, um, yeah, it, it's not talking about a specific system and say, okay, we have these complementary informations and these passwords, and this is how we do this. Um, but it's nice because then we can use, so for instance, F here is, so F is a singleton set, so there's only one element in that set, that's F, so what's the function F in this case, the lowercase f? That's the identity function, right? So it's return whatever the argument is, right? So, um, so this just maps every A to the exact same element in C. And then L to test is very easy. You just do an uh, equal. So you test is the A that you're given equal to the C that you have. And if so, then you put true. And S is kind of, in this case, just whatever function is set or change the password and create new. So is this a good model? So let's think about what do we want from a authentication system? Were it not to disclose C. We, well, I mean, at a high level, what do we actually want? <coughs> We talked about what do we what do we want the function. Um, we talked about we're talking specifically now about something that you know at least in this case, right? Or I guess it doesn't matter. But what do we actually want? Let's go back to the the overall kind of high level view. What do we want from this? authenticates the correct person that is trying to authenticate. Right, so how would it do that using some of these terms? I mean, yeah. Uh, <coughs> making sure that the information that the authentication system has matches the information that the user who's trying to authenticate themselves uh, provides to them. Right, so definitely, so that's, so one thing we want is kind of 
as I think both of you are getting at a little bit, is more just functionality, right? We want to see, make sure that when I use the system, if I provide the same A that I originally enrolled in the system or I, I created a user with, that the that L will return true, right? If I come with the same A, they should authenticate me to the system. But what if I have an L function that just always returns true? Which you laugh, there's actually, I'll try to find this bug, but there's a bug in Dropbox, I think it's probably back in 08 or 09 or something like that. No, maybe 2010, it doesn't matter. But they push some change that caused all password checks to return true. So you can log into anybody's Dropbox account just by putting in a different email address and whatever you wanted for the password and it would return true, right? Which is funny because for a lot of people, like if you're using a password manager that automatically injects your password without you knowing, you would never know that it's actually doing this. Or even if you're just logging in correctly, right? You'd never know this. I think somebody found it because, I think it was live for like a half hour or a couple hours or something until somebody like fat fingered or knew they mistyped their password and then logged in and realized it still logged them in. And so then they logged out and started testing and then told Dropbox who fixed it immediately. Um, so why don't we just turn this L function and say it will always return true? Because it's still functional, right? If I come back with A, then I can log in. I, I'm in, right? L returns true, I'm good. Purpose defeated. The what? It defeats the purpose. It defeats the what, what kind of purpose? purpose of the system, and everyone is authenticated all the time, and everyone's happy. Right, yeah, so it's more about like a, a security, or at least authentication um, like the requirement that we want. eliminate a group of people that don't have the necessary information. Correct. So how would we then describe that requirement here in our system? L is not trivial. No. <laughs> you could write some. You could write an L that's complicated, but that doesn't. Uh, that still is not secure. It could L could randomly say true or false, right? That's not trivial. We want it, we want L to evaluate to true uh, only when that specific A cross C happens, right? Like, and and to make sure that it, it, I don't well, think one to one is the right <coughs> word, but. Yeah, so it's, it's more about, it's what we've been talking about, right? So we're trying to link, we want to see, basically what we want is when you register and you provide us with a lowercase a, that later on you're providing us with that same lowercase a, right? But we don't actually always store a, which is what this system says, we're actually storing c, so we're storing some transformation, let's say, of a to some other thing, and so we check if those things match, and then we usually say yes. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, yes. So then. So then, oh, sorry. Oh, so, yeah, go ahead. L returns true if and only if the F of little A1 a yep. is equal to little c1. So, if the, yes. of course, the, we run the F function on a little a, that it responds, or we get as output the corresponding little c. Cool. Yeah, that's the way I would, Great. I would think about that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other ways to formulate that. You could say, like, if, if let's say, some A, that L returns true for some A and C1, then it must be the case that that A is equal to A1. Right? So that's saying, like, if you can get in with that same A, then that means that must have been the original A. If it's anything else, then you're violating that, that clause, right? If you could just type in gibberish and get in, then that would violate that, that argument. Cool. All right. So does this get us what we want from those cases? What did we want, I guess? The two properties we just derived. You literally gave us both. <coughs> the second one. <coughs> so functionality and security. So is it the case of this system that if I log in with an A, an A1, or I create an account with A1, and then I come back with that same A1 later, will L return true? Yes. Yes. Is it the case that if somebody else comes with some A prime that is not the same as my A1, will L return true? Probably not. Probably not? Tell me. It might. Why? If A prime happens to be the same as A1. I just said it's not. So A prime that is specifically not A. Anything, any element that is not A, A1. And no, so it does, it does 
does satisfy our two basic requirements, right? It satisfies functionality and the basic, let's say, authentication requirement. Awesome. Cool. We'll look at one other one. We're going to look at some of them, and then we're going to talk about attacks, and then we're going to circle back to, to think of why these are actually different methods. Um, but Unix kind of originally was one of the first systems to have this kind of standard hash function. And the idea was, uh, so just like uh, what we talked about, so actually uh, the set of all characters you could use in your password for Unix was eight characters, and most eight characters or less. It was not restrict. I think the only other restriction was no, excuse me, was no uh, null character. So the null byte was not acceptable, but I believe everything else technically is. Although how you actually type those is interesting. And so, so the idea here is rather than store the passwords in plain text, we're going to run some hash function on the, the code and store that as our C. So we actually are not storing the passwords themselves. So uh, we'll talk about that we have this ID concatenated with an 11 character hash. So why do we want to use a hash now that we've known we've studied crypto? Or what does, let's say this, what does using a hash mean? take some little c in there, you can't, you shouldn't be able to go backwards to find that a, right? That's kind of the premise of hash functions, right? That was one of the main properties of hash functions. Uh, we'll talk about what this ID does, but you can uh, basically think uh, what they do is actually, and this is why we have, think about these things in terms of sets. Rather than f being a single function that does the hash, right? f is something that uh, takes in and lowercase a and returns a c. F will actually be 4096 different versions. Uh, and this two character hash ID will tell us which version to use. Um, and L is, oh yeah, the things that actually do the checking are the login function, SU, um, any of these programs will try to verify your password, and they basically will take the A, run it through the algorithm F, and then verify whether the F that it, the C that's stored is the C is the um, same as the one that was generated from running it on that new input. And changing that is basically you have all kinds of ways to change your password. Cool. So does this? Actually, um, does this scheme satisfy the two requirements that we talked about? So does it require the, does it satisfy the functionality requirement? If our other one, our more basic case, we said met the two requirements, right? So mm -hmm. this is, I don't think this just restricted our base, basic case, right? Uh, I don't know that I would argue that way just because um, you never know, well, just because something is based on something basic that you've proven or demonstrated yourself doesn't mean you didn't introduce changes that completely break things. Mm -hmm. um, but we can use the same reasoning there, right? We can say, okay, if I have, I register with some password A, which is a string eight characters or less, the server will choose one of these 496, um, choose a function F, will then generate a C, which it will store, and then later on, if I give that same password A to the login program, it will then 
look up C, C tells it what F to use, it will run the algorithm and check that that C matches the one that came out of running F again. So it would say that yes, you know, these two match. So that would verify that yes, I, when I actually use it with the same password, I get there. So what if I put in a different password A1 that is not
that says, hey, I would like to register with the system. I want the user account Alice, and my password is password. This is a bad example. Don't put your password as password. We'll talk about why in a second. So what does the service provider then do? Does it store a password? So this is an example of the, the Unix standard hash function. Yeah, so it uses something of F. It then generates the name. So this associates, so it always has to associate kind of back to the identity, right? So there needs to be some way to map back there. And then it calculates the uh, Unix hash of this password, which is here. So this is A, this is C that gets generated from, this is the lowercase a and the lowercase c that gets generated from here. It stores this. Um, ah, yeah, so that's very easy. So then um, it stores this in a file, which we'll see in a second, which I think we've already actually looked at a little bit. Uh, and then when Alice tries to log on again and say, hey, this is Alice, right? She'll provide the password. And so um, the service provider will take Alice's, uh, take the given password, the new A, say a prime, hash it with the function and verify that outcome with the stored C that it's stored in server. If it's correct, it'll return true. If not, it'll return false. So we want to break this. Now we want to think about this like an attacker. What is our goal as an attacker? No. Access the system. Yes. We want to access the system as another user, right? So, um, so this, I think, is an important distinction, right? Because it actually doesn't matter as long as we can get onto the system as the other user. I actually don't care if I know their password or not. Um, so. And we can express that in our language by just saying that, hey, we want to find some A, so some password in the password space, such that for the F that's used, well, when we, had, when we run that on F, it's the same. And C is associated with the entity that we want. So there's usually two types of ways we can go about this. So think about this now from an attacker's perspective. So what information does the attacker actually have? What was that? They probably have the username. Probably have the username, but it's usually, yeah. So we, uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit, but yeah, definitely we want to think, okay, the attacker knows the identity of, let's say, a person that they're trying to, to attack. So what else do they know? Think about the different situations maybe you've used this. They probably know, I would say F, they would know F, right? They would know the set of functions that are used. Do they know the given C's? Or do they know, well, what am I trying to say? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Do they know the C's? The yes. Yes, when? So let's say that let's say this. Let's say you're trying to break into my account on the submission server, and you're trying to do this. Do you know the the list of C's? The web app vulnerable to SQL injection. Nobody's found one yet through four security courses, so I don't think so. Not to say there's not. No? Do you know your hash, your hash or any fellow hashes from anyone else? 
do you know what algorithm I'm using to hash your passwords? No. What do you have access to? This is our attacker's goal. So maybe it'll help to think about, well, how would you then? So let's say we're on a system. So let's say we have a direct approach. You're on an old school Unix system in the 70s, 80s. It has an ETC password file that has everyone's hash in it. How do you break that? That doesn't just give you A, right? How do you do it? <coughs> brute force. Always get brute force first, right? Brute force. So what do you have brute force walking through? Uh, well, we have we have hashed, right? So that's where yes. we just start. We could just start running through every possible combination and seeing what that hashed out to. And then when we found, what, what would you? Seen. How would you brute force it? So you just try. So let's say we're going to guess it's just all alphanumeric characters. So you start with a string full of, let's say, five or, I don't know, whatever length you want to do, six or seven. You start with all lowercase a's. You try that, hash it, compare. And then you change the last one to b, hash it, compare, change the last one to c, it's hash it, compare. For strict brute force, I mean, that, yeah, that wouldn't, but a, a, a better, I don't know if you'd call it more of an intelligent brute force, but try to find uh, common passwords or... Like when we thought of earlier with what interests you had, you know, 
try typing in password or admin, see what the hash is. So if that could be a way. I don't know, that's not the best way, I'm sure. Cool, yeah, so, well, yes, one thing would be if you found, if you were able to actually break the underlying hash function, then you could maybe try it that way. Um, a much easier approach is you always need to remember these are humans creating passwords most times, unless you're using a password generator to automatically generate that password. But fundamentally, there must be some pass, you know, most of these passwords are things that a user created to try to know and tr because they need to remember them when they come back, right? This isn't something we necessarily talked about here. Um, so we can try, for a given C, we can try, let's say, the top 10,000 or 100,000 most common passwords. Yeah, that would definitely work. Now let's even transport us, so let's go. Let's simplify this version. So actually the original version, I believe, did not have this two character hash ID. So it just had a, was used, let's say, MD5 or some hash function. So now the idea is you have not only just some C that you're interested in, you actually have a list of all the C's on the system, right? You have every single hash on the system. So if you just want to break into any account, all you need to do is run your password cracker, or sorry, run your brute force algorithm generating common passwords, uh, maybe try English words, and generate hashes and compare those hashes with the, all of the list of all the users on the system. When you get a match, that's when you know you found something. Um, and you've broken that password. How can we prevent this? Is it impossible? Limit the amount of uh, attempts, password attempts, with uh, like a time variable. Mm. So where would you do that in our system? In our system, it'd be uh, at the, the access function. What's that? Is that S? The manipulation function? Or L. Login. L. L. Yes. So we could have L be such that on usually mainly on an unsuccessful login, you actually add some delay, right? So with this. Would this help in the case that we actually have access to the EPC, the hashes? No, no. No. But it does help in the case of the websites, right? So have you probably noticed this before on most, I think most systems, when you type in your password to log into your computer incorrectly, it'll usually delay it. And there are sometimes, I think in some systems, will be an exponentially longer delay. Uh, have I told you a story about the phone? So um, you can also set that up with your phone so that when you put in an incorrect passcode, it will, after a certain number of times, lock you out for, I think, first 30 seconds and then a minute. And then, so I had a friend who uh, thought it was hilarious to do this to people, to lock them out of their own phones. So he was doing this on somebody's phone, inputting the incorrect PIN code, locked it out for five minutes, and then did it one more time. And then the group policy kicked in to delete the entire contents of the phone. So the phone started wiping, and he felt really bad. Uh, luckily, the person had everything backed up, I think. So I think it was a good story. Although maybe I should check. I don't know if they're, I think they're still friends. But uh, yeah, he no longer does that to people, because it's not funny. <laughs> because you can actually set up policies like that on your phone and wipe the phone after a certain number of tries. So that way, if somebody wants to try to brute force it, they have five tries, oh, I should bring in my device. So. I actually bought a device for older iPhones where um, what you do is you, it tries, it goes in here to try to crack the pin using that interface and then you also hook it up to something, I think it's on the battery or on the reset or something and so before it actually triggers that you input it incorrectly, it resets the phone so it doesn't actually store the fact that you made an attempt and so it just keeps doing this here <coughs> brute force I think a four digit pin in like three or four days or something. Um, anyway, it's really cool. Uh, so, when we come back, we'll talk about preventing attacks. Um, if anybody, once again, if anybody wants to make any announcements for good or evil at the um, at class on Tuesday, feel free.